Live from Washington, D.C., it's theCUBE. Covering .next Conference. Brought to you by Nutanix. We're back, this is Dave Vellante with Stu Miniman, and this is the wrap of .next, Nutanix's customer event, hashtag NextConf, and this is theCUBE, the leader in the live tech coverage for enterprise technology, Stu. Second day, um, yeah, I got to say, Nutanix has always done a good job. They have innovative venues, they do funky, fun stuff with marketing. We haven't seen the end of it. We have another keynote today. There's a keynote tomorrow morning. Big names, Bill McDermott's here. We just saw Peter McKay. Uh, Chad Sackich is here. Uh, who am Diane I missing? Green. Diane Green was up yesterday. And we, you know, thought leaders had the CEO of NASDAQ on this morning, Dave. Yeah. I mean, you know, really good customers, thought leaders. Uh, Nutanix always makes me think a little bit, which uh, I really enjoy. My fourth one of these, Dave, usually by the fourth show I've gotten to, it's like, I, I've yeah, seen it. Right. You know, have we made progress? Where are we going? I thought Sunil Pody's comment was really interesting. He said, look, we saw the trends. We knew that you know, hardware was going down. I mean, they're essentially admitting that they were a hardware-oriented company, infrastructure company. We saw what was happening for, to infrastructure and hyper-converged, and we could have just packed it up then sold the company for a bunch of money. You know, there were rumors floating around, you know they, and they pre-IPO, they easily could have sold this thing for a billion plus, all could have cashed out and made a bunch of dough. And they said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to do something different, we're going to go for it. They, you know, you got to love the ambition. And so many companies today just can't weather that independent storm. I mean, you know, you've, you've seen it over and over and over again. The last billion dollar storage company that remained independent was NetApp, that was 14 years ago. Now, Nutanix isn't a storage company. You've got to look around here, look at the analysts, a bunch of storage guys you know, that have grown up. And it's, to me, Stu, it's a representation of what's happening in the marketplace. Storage as we know it is going away, and it always is transformed. You know, it used to be spinning disk drives, then it was subsystems, and it was the SAN, and now it's evolving. These guys call it uh, invisible infrastructure, call it whatever you want, but it's, it's moving toward infrastructure as code, um, which is just a stepping stone to cloud. So your thoughts on the event, the ecosystem, and their position in the marketplace? Yeah, so, right, they reach a certain point, you know, they, they, they've gone public, you know, can they keep innovating? Uh, you look at, you know, the number of announcements there, we spent a lot of time uh, talking about the new, you know, Cloud Xi, uh, you know, service out there, which, Zai. Zai. Zai? Zai. Zai, sorry, Zai. Yeah, you got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> pronunciation of some of these, it's uh, Newtonix, right? Yeah, uh, right. Uh, they, they made jokes about the, 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 the company last year, right. um, but you know, the, this year, uh, you know, that's product, we're talking vision. Uh, the ink is still drying on the, con on the relationship with Google. Doesn't mean they haven't been working for a while, but you know, where this deal goes, interested to see you know, where it is you know, six months from now, a, a year from now, because also Google, small player. I mean, it, it wasn't, to be honest, uh, I was at the Red Hat Summit, and they had a video of Andy Jassy saying, we've got, you know, we're extending AWS with OpenShift, and you're like, wow, you know, Amazon, a, a, a Red Hat has a position in a lot of clouds, but for Andy Jassy to make an appearance, you know, Amazon, the behemoth in the cloud, that's good. Look, getting Diane Green here, I said, number one, it gives Nutanix credibility, number two, it really pokes at VMware a little bit. She's like, yeah, I did this before, and you know, everybody's like, well, she's here now at Nutanix. Nutanix wants to be, uh, that they've compared themselves to both Amazon, uh, I think we hear it was Sunil or Diraj uh, in an analyst session said, they want to be like the A block. You know, not the V block that EMC did, but you know, the Amazon block for the enterprise, uh, or the, the, the next VMware, the, the, the new operating system. It, it, it's funny, in, in a lot of my circles, you know, we, we've been trying to kill the operating system for a while. I need just enough operating system. I want to you know, serverless and containerize all of these things uh, because we need to modernize and you know, the old you know, general purpose processor and general purpose operating system has come and gone, it's, it's seen its day. Uh, but you know, Nutanix has a play there. When I look at some of the things going, we're talking about you know, micro-segmentation, Dave. We're talking about you know, multi-cloud and some interesting pieces. Um, I, I like the ecosystem, I like 
that balance of how do you, you keep growing and expand where they can go into, uh, you know, leading the customers, but you know, they're delivering today, they've got real products, they've got real growth. Uh, sure, they have some challenges as to that competitive uh, back and forth, but you asked Chad Sackage if this reminded him of Dell EMC, um, and kind of that partnership that they had for years. Remind me a little bit of kind of EMC and VMware too. Once EMC bought VMware, VMware, the relationship they had, you know, HP and IBM and other companies that they needed to treat as good or better than EMC. There's some of those tough relationships and Dell with Nutanix, their partner, not only to do Dell XC, but now they're doing like Pivotal on top of it. They can do Hyper-V deployments. Uh, Lenovo's another partner. Nutanix is, 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 is broadening their approach. Uh, there's, there's a lot of options out there and a lot of things to dig into interesting. Um, they keep growing their customers, keep delighting their customers. Uh, it reminds me of you know, other shows we go to, Dave, like you know, it's Amazon reInvent, customers are super excited. You've been, you tell me about the Splunk conference and the ServiceNow conference, uh, where those customers are just, they're in there, they're excited, and Nutanix is another one of those, that every year you come, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, there's good solid content, there's a, a, a customer base that is growing uh, and exciting and sharing, uh, and that's a fun one uh, to, to be part of. So, I want to ask you about VMware. You know, it's kind of a good, good reference model. EMC paid, I don't know, $630 million <laughs> for VMware, which was the greatest acquisition in enterprise IT history. Yeah. I think no question about it in terms of return. Uh, a couple questions for you. you. You were there at the time, you signed the original NDA between EMC and VMware, kind of sniffed them out. Um, would VMware's ascendancy been as fast and as successful, or even more successful, without EMC, would VMware have got there on its own? So I don't think so, Dave, because my information that I had and some of it's piecing together after the fact is VMware was really looking for kind of that, that you know, company to help them get to the next state. You know, the, the fundraising was a little bit different back you know, in, in, in 2003 uh, than it was later, but uh, you know, rumors were Symantec was going to buy them. Everybody I talked to, you'd know better than me, Dave, if Symantec had bought them, they would have integrated it into all their pieces, they would have squashed it, you know, the original talent probably would have fled much sooner. EMC didn't really know what they had. You know, I, I, I'd worked on some of the due diligence for some of the product integrations, which took years and years to deliver, and it was mostly, we're going to buy them. Diane had a bit of a tense relationship with Joe Tucci kind of from day one, and it was like, okay, you're out there in Palo Alto, you know, we're on the other coast, you go do your thing and you grow, and by the time EMC had gotten into VMware a little bit more, they were much bigger. So I think, it, it, as you said, they've one of the great success stories. EMC did best in a lot of its acquisitions where it either let it, ran a division and go or let it kind of sit on its own and just funded it more. So I, I think that well, was a Well, and the story was always story. that Diane was pissed because she sold out at such a low price, but yeah. that's sort of ancient history. The reason I brought that up is, is I want to try to draw the parallel with Nutanix today. And, and come back to what you were saying about the A block. When you look at Amazon, They've, we agree, they have a lead. Whether that lead is five years, seven years, four years, probably more like five to seven, but you know, whatever. Whatever it is, it's a lead, it's a substantive. Beyond the infrastructure, uh, the, the, the storage and the, and the compute, they're building out just all kinds of services. I mean, you just look at their website and whether it's messaging, I mean, on and on and on. There's database, there's AI, there's, there's, there's their version of VDI, there's, there's, there's all this big data stuff, things like Kinesis, and on and on and on, so many services that, that are much, much larger than the entire Nutanix ecosystem. So the reason for all this background is, does Nutanix need you know, a, a, a bigger, can Nutanix become its, its ambition, which is essentially to be the next VMware without some kind of white knight? Um, so my answer, Dave, is, if you look at Nutanix's ambition, one of the challenges for every infrastructure company today, if you think, okay, we talked about true private cloud, Dave. What services can I run on that? How can I leverage that? Look at Amazon, you know, thousand new services coming every year. Look at Google, they've got, you know, TensorFlow, really cool stuff, they've got those brilliant people coming up with the next stuff. How do I get that in my environment? Well, Nutanix's answer coming at the show was, we're going to partner with Google. 
we're going to have that partnership, you're going to be able to plug in, and you want to do your analytics and everything, use, use GCP. They're great at that. We're not, we know that you, you need to be able to leverage Google services to do that. Uh, the Red Hat announcement that I mentioned before, another way how I can take OpenShift and bridge from my data center and my environment, get access to the services. The promise of VMware on Amazon, yeah, we're going to have a similar stack that I can go there, but I want to be able to access those VMware servers. Now, could it suck them eventually into all of Amazon and leave VMware behind? A absolutely, it's tough to partner with Amazon. So, the thing I've been looking at at almost every show this year is, how are you tying into and working with those public clouds? Uh, we talked about it at VeeamOn, Dave. You know, they have you know, Microsoft up on stage, they have you know, you know, partnerships uh, with the HPE public cloud was up players. There. But the public cloud players, if, if you're not allowing your customers and the infrastructure that you're building to find ways to leverage and access those public cloud services, which you know, not only are they spending you know, $10 billion a year for each one of the big guys on infrastructure to get all around the globe, but it's all of those new services you said moving up the stack. You know, it, to stitch together that in your own environment is going to be really challenging. How many different software pieces, how do I license it, how do I get it on as opposed to, oh, I'm in the public cloud, it's a checkbox. Okay, I want to access that and I consume it as I need it. That consumption model uh, it needs to change. So. I think Nutanix understands that's directionally where they want to go. I look at the Calm software that they launched and say, hey, you want to use TensorFlow? Oh, it's just a choice here, absolutely, go. Where is it and how do I use it? Well, some of these details need to be worked out. As Aditya said, it's not like it's you know, not one click for every application, any cloud, anywhere, but that's directionally where they're going to make it easy. So all that cool analytics stuff that we cover a lot on theCUBE, it's a lot of that's now happening in the cloud and I should be able to access it whether I'm in my private cloud or public cloud and it's just going to be a consumption model, whether I you know, have certain characteristics that make it that I'm going to want to have that infrastructure for whether that's you know, governance or locality. We talked to Scholastic uh, yesterday and they said, well look, when you've got manufacturing in books, I need things close to where they're you know, coming off the production line. Otherwise, you know, there's things that I'm, I'm doing in the public cloud. So that's where we see when I talk to, you know, you know, companies like I do here uh, at, at the, the uh, Vienna show last year when I talked to you know, Christian Riley with Citrix who had been at Bechtel uh, for many years. There, there's reasons why things need to live close uh, to what's happening. You know, we've talked a lot about edge and therefore you know, public cloud doesn't win at all. I know we had one guest on uh, this week that said, right, depending on what industry you're in, is, is it a 30-70 mix or a 70-30 mix? Or, you know, there, there, there's a lot of nuance to sort this out and this is a long game, Dave. You know, there's this, this change of the way we do things is, is a journey and you know, Dutanix is positioning themselves uh, to continue to grow, continue to expand. Uh, you know, some, some good ambition to expand on, you know, like the five vectors of uh, support that they have. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I, I liked what I've heard this so week. So, in thinking about, you know, what we're talking about VMware, the imperative for virtualization was so high in the early 2000s because we were coming out of the dot-com bust, IT was out of favor, VMware was really the only game in town. There, was, there really wasn't a strong alternative had by far the best product. Yeah. Microsoft Hyper-V was sort of, you know, in concept, you know, and, and KVM and others were just really not there. So there really was no choice. So it appealed to 100% of the IT shops, I mean, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder though today, is the imperative for multi-cloud the same? The, the, the fundamental is, yes, everybody has multiple clouds, but this industry has lived in stovepipes forever and is, figured out how to manage stovepipes. It manages them by you know, fencing things off. So I wonder, is the imperative as high, you could maybe make an argument that it's, that it's higher, but I'm still not quite getting it yet, as it was in the early 2000s where the aspirin of virtualization to soothe the pain of do more with less was such an obvious and game-changing you know, paradigm shift. I, I don't see it as much here. I see people still trying to figure out, okay, what is our cloud strategy? Yeah. You know, so I, I don't necessarily, number one, number two is the competition is, 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 seems to be much more wide open. Yeah. You know, it's unclear at this time that, that any one company has a fast track yeah, to the multi-cloud. I, I think you've got some really good points there, Dave. A thing that I, I've pointed out a few times is that one of the things that bothered me from the early days with VMware is 
from an application standpoint, it tended to freeze my application. I didn't have a reason to kind of move forward and modernize my application. Uh, you know, back in 2002 it was like, oh, I'm running Windows NT with a really old uh, you know, application, my operating system's going to end of life, well maybe it's time to uplift. Oh wait, there's this great you know, virtualization stuff, yeah. my hardware's going end of life too. No, shove it in a VM, let's keep it for another five years. Oh my God, that application sucked then, it's going to suck even more in five <laughs> years, and workforce productivity was way down. So, the vision for Nutanix is, they're going to be a platform that are going to be able to you know, help you modernize your environments uh, and you know, how do we get beyond, you know, is it virtualization to containerization, is it you know, a, a lot of the you know, cloud native pieces, how does that fit in? Starting to hear a little bit more of it, a critique I'd have on NHCI uh, about two years ago was it was the same, same applications that were in my VMware SAN, uh, you know, not vSAN, but you know, my, my just traditional storage area network uh, it was what was running on Nutanix. We're starting to see more interesting applications uh, go, going on there. Um, and you know, look, Nutanix has a bullseye on them. There are all the HCI direct replacements. There is the you know, threat of the cloud. And you know, I haven't heard as many SaaS applications living on Nutanix as I do when you know, we talk to you know, all Flash array companies, Dave. Every single one of them you know, can roll out. Here's all these SaaS deployments on our environment, just you know, scalable environments. Uh, that, that, that build that for the future. I, I haven't heard it as much from Nutanix. So yet. VMware was aspirin. Nutanix originally started as aspirin, and now they're pivoting to vitamin. <laughs> Who are they up against? Who do you like? Who are the horses on the track? Let's 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 analyze the race and then uh, wrap. Yeah. So when Nutanix got into this business, it was, well, they're, they're, they're helping VMware environments. It was, you know, 100% VMware when they first started, that relationship with VMware was really tough. Uh, they've lowered that to, you know, they've now got, what, 28% is running HV, they've got a little bit on, on, on Hyper-V, but they've still got about 60% of their customers are VMware, so VMware, you know, huge challenge. vSAN has more customers than anyone in the hyperconverged infrastructure space. Easy, number of customers, but virtualization admin's taking that. Microsoft, huge potential threat. Azure Stack's coming this year. It's been coming, it's been coming. It's really close there. All the server guys are lining up. Microsoft's a huge player. Microsoft owns applications. They're pulling applications into their SaaS offerings, they're pulling applications into Azure. When they launch Azure Stack, even if the 1.0, if you looked at it on paper and says, say Nutanix is better, well, that's a huge, Microsoft's a huge threat to both VMware, which uses a lot of Microsoft apps, as well as Nutanix. So those are the two biggest threats. Uh, and then of course, there's just the general trend of push to SaaS and push to public cloud, where Nutanix is starting to play in the multi-cloud as we talked about, and Calm, and uh, the, you know, the DR cloud services are good, but can Nutanix you know, continue to stay ahead of their customers? Uh, they're ahead of most of the, you know, the, 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 the vast majority of enterprises, but they can, can they convince them to come on board to them rather than you know, some of these big guys. Nutanix is a public company now, they're doing great, but you know, yeah, they're, they're, it's a big TAM that they're going after, but that means they're going to have attacks from every side of the market. Yeah, and I just don't, see, I mean, I see HCI as one where you know, you got a leader and that leader can make some good money. I don't see multi-cloud as a winner-take-all market because I think IBM's going to have its play in multi-cloud, HPE has its play in multi-cloud, Dell EMC is going to have its play in multi-cloud. You got guys coming out of, of different places like ServiceNow, who's got an IT operations management you know, practice, business big, hundreds of millions of dollars of business there coming at multi-cloud, so a lot of different competitors that are going to be going for it, and, and some of them are very large, with very large service organizations, uh, that I think are going to get their fair share. So I would predict, Stu, that this is going to continue to be, multi-cloud is going to be a multi-stovepipe cloud for a long, long time. Now, if Nutanix can come in and, and solve that control plane problem and demonstrate substantial business value and, and deliver competitive advantage, you know, that might, change the game, it's, it's difficult at this point in 2017 to see that Nutanix over those other guys that I just mentioned has an advantage, clear advantage, maybe from a product standpoint, maybe, um, but from a resource standpoint, a distribution channel, services organization, ecosystem, all those other things, you know, they seem to me to be 
to be counterbalancing. All right, I'll give you a last thought. Yeah, so it, it's great to see Nutanix. They're, they're, they're aiming high, they're, they're expanding into a couple areas, uh, and, and they keep listening, so I hope uh, you know, they, they keep listening to their customers, expand their partnerships. Uh, SaaS customers be really interested. The service provider is something that they've gotten into a little bit, but you know, plenty more opportunity for them to go there. Uh, Dave, personally for me, it's been a company I, I've watched since you know, the earliest days. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure to watch. I, you know, I think back, right, VMware, you said, I think it was a 100 person company when I first started talking to them and Diane Green, and I look at where VMware went. You know, I, I, I've been tracking VMware for now five years, and you know, reminds me a lot of, of, of some of those trends. For a 20-person company, I said, dear, I said almost 3,000, boggles the mind. I've been to their headquarters a bunch. Uh, so uh, it, it's been fun to watch the Newton Army, and uh, they've been loving watching it uh, from our, 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 our Well, well and, and these events are very good events, and, and so uh, there's a lot of passion here, and it, that's a great fundamental for this company. So, so I, I, I'm a fan, I think, I, think it's, uh, I think it may be undervalued. I think it very well may be undervalued. Yeah, Wall Street uh, definitely doesn't yeah. understand this stuff. So, <laughs> all right, Stu, great working with you. Uh, this, this year, this month, you know, this quarter, this month, certainly this show, so great job. I Thanks, really Dave. appreciate it. There's a big crew behind you know, what Stu and I and John Furrier and Jeff Frick and others do here. Uh, here today with us, Ava. Patrick, Alex, Jay, you guys have had, had an awesome spring. Uh, uh, Brendan is, is somewhere, I guess Brendan's doing the keynote right now. So, fantastic job, as always, Kristen Nicole and, and her team writing up the articles. You know, Jay Johnson back at the, the controls. Uh, Bert with the crowd chats. Everybody, really appreciate all your support. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you, we got a little break, I think, in the action, because it's July 4th. Uh, well, it's Canada year, uh, Canada week. Canada Day Canada and Day. Uh, Independence and, and Day next week. Independence Day in the United States. And then we'll be at Infor Inforum, second week of July, I'll be there with, uh, with uh, Rebecca Knight and the crew, so, so watch for that. Check out siliconangle.com for all the news, wikibon.com for all the research, and thecube.net to find all these videos, youtube.com slash siliconangle. It's everywhere, if you can't find it, you're not on Twitter, you're not on social. Thanks for watching everybody. This is Dave Vellante with Stu Miniman, we're out. <laughs>